Uh, okay, so this is this is this talk is about uh, Linux kernel code reviews, um, and uh, uh, as an introduction, this was a this is a talk that I gave that I gave uh, at or actually it was a in, uh, formal Intel University class that I taught uh, at Intel uh, last August actually, um, and it, it, it's it's from the perspective of a, uh, a vendor tree provider, so. For the past, oh geez, it feels like 20 years, but it, for the past seven years or so, I've, I've been working in, in the Android space, providing uh, on the Linux kernel for Android at Intel since about 2009 or 10. And, um, and uh, so this is, this is based on my experience um, from doing that. Um, let's see. So I'm just kind of, I just kind of kept it, you know, in a course, in a course lecture format just because I thought it'd be easiest for me. Uh, so I'm just going to review the, the goals of the course and uh, we're going to talk, and there will be just a handful of fairly lame or tame, tame examples uh, coming from this GitHub tree, which is really, it's, it's, um, what, what this is, is this is a rebase of a Android Things kernel that, that from a 4.4 kernel to a 4.9 kernel, and I'm trying to get uh, mature uh, to be a base for, to, uh, mature enough to, to feed uh, actually uh, the Yakta Meta Intel uh, layer. Um, and uh, um, I, when I first thought about doing this course, I thought it would be hilarious to to basically throw up a lot of examples and, and talk smack about the, the patches. Uh, but then as, as I got, time went on, I started thinking more. He's like, yeah, I don't know if I really want to be showing internal code. And I'm pretty sure I don't want to take code from other, other vendors and uh, embarrass people too much. So I decided just to I, you know, so the examples aren't as expressive as the examples I have for the internal class, uh, and that's just the way it is. <laughs> so um, I, I will describe some patches as we go as well. Um, if you have a burning question, go ahead and interrupt me. But otherwise, I just kind of want to go through the class, go through the lecture, and then take questions at the end. Um, and uh, so the goals of this class. So basically, at, by the end of the class, I really want people to kind of understand uh, what code reviewers are expected to look for uh, as you, oh, I also want to, I got to back up just one, one little bit. Um, this is, um, I want to make clear that this, these code review practices are, are important for people working on non-upstream code. So this would be like a Linux stable tree or a tree that, that, that isn't tracking upstream. So a, lot, a, a number of the things m don't make sense when applied to upstream development. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so by the end of the class, you'll, you'll understand what the code reviews are expected to look at when they're looking at your code. And, and um, and uh, um, you know, hopefully you'll get to know, get a little bit a better appreciation of uh, what's expected from your code during a review. You'll you'll also hopefully understand the mindset of customers a little better. Um, you'll you'll understand the utility of having a good uh, prefix discipline. Um, you'll be able to identify a problem with a patch that needs to be fixed, and you'll be able to explain what the what the issue is with the patch. And uh, so I left this in here just, just as a reference because I believe that everybody working, in, working on any kernel code should read these two files, the submitting patches and coding style, about twice a year. Uh, so they're here for your reference so you can refresh your mind, rem memories. So. Burp, burp, burp. Really? Oh, oh, okay. 
Uh, how do I hide it? Okay, how about down there? Okay. Uh, so, uh, what do customers think of you? Think of you and your code? Well, you know, customers actually don't trust you, and they don't trust your code. Um, they do not want to see changes after beta releases, other than bug fixes they care about explicitly. Uh, they scrub every change in detail that you provide as you provide your kernel. Um, and as as work progresses, you know, you give them an initial release, and they start working on it themselves, and you keep working on it. And when you pro as you provide releases later and later in the program, they really get resentful of of your updates. Uh, and and if they could bill if they could bill you back for the overhead associated with refreshing their tree with with your update, they would do that. Um, it's it's not really a good relationship, typically. <laughs> um, to be fair, I have my own opinions about the customer's kernel practices. Um, you know, so um, basically customers are, are, are system integration teams, system integration and system debug teams. You know, they, they, they can't understand how to use anything but Garrett uh, in a mechanical way uh, to manage their technical debt. Um, they don't plan for security maintenance. They don't appreciate security maintenance. They don't plan for rebases and, and kernel migrations. Uh, they don't upstream their bug fixes to, that they depend on. And by upstream, I mean uh, feed them back to, to me as a provider of the kernel to them. Um, uh, they don't provide visibility into changes they're making. Uh, and they're driven by purely time to market risk and short-term cost and long-term program viability you know uh, they just don't care you know it's 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 um, let's see I think I wanted to say something a little bit more about this um, okay um, uh, let's see I did have another thing I wanted to say um, one of the reasons why we, I'll get, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later. Okay, some high level policies. Pretty much as you do, as you're doing a code review, you need to make sure that uh, a good commit comment prefix discipline is applied. And the reason why we need this, pre, this, this discipline is because you may be working on the 4.4 kernel today, but you're gonna be working on the 4.9 kernel or some other kernel tomorrow. And without, without having this discipline, migrating, migrating your code from one kernel version to the other is almost, on, you can't do it. I don't think you can do it. Um, and as a code reviewer, you need to, it's important for you to review this policy because as a member of the kernel team, assuming you guys are part of a kernel team, it's gonna be your job to migrate to that new kernel. So it's, this is just to cover your butt. Okay, so the, this, this is a copy and paste from that, um, well, slightly modified copy and paste from that URL uh, from the Brillo code. So this is essentially the uh, commit prefix conventions that the, the Chrome OS team created and they expanded it and they continued it on and in, in, they're applying it in the Brillo space. So essentially there's, there's a number of these prefixes that you, they want you to put in the front of the uh, the commit comment. So you have upstream, and what upstream means is basically you were able to successfully do a git cherry pit dash capital X uh, from the upstream kernel to get whatever patch it, you need into your um, older kernel. And there were, no, there were no merge commits. Backport, it's just like upstream, except there is a commit, con there is a merge conflict and you had to fix it up. Uh, the from list, this is, this, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I use it, I like, I, I, I use it for both from mailing list and from, from feeder, feeder trees that are feeding uh, Linux next, but essentially this is code that isn't yet in, in upstream, uh, oh, uh, by the way, upstream means kernel.org, minus this tree. Um, uh, from list means to me, it means it either came from a mailing list or it came from a, um, a, a 
a develop a, a maintainer tree that's feeding Linux next. So this is this is basically things like I have some I have some USB patches from Felipe. Um, uh, I don't think they're actually on any mailing list, but they're in his they're in his tree that's queued up for Linux next. So that's that's what you would prefix your patch if you got it from there. Then you have some OS specific patches. These are these can either come from the in the Android in Brillo case, it, they come from um, uh, the AOSP common.git project. Um, uh, they have a bunch of reference branches. But these could be, you know, and I have an example later uh, associated with Yocto. Um, but they could be anything that's really not upstreamable or um, uh, not upstream yet that, that is important for a particular operating system. Uh, the vendor, the vendor tag. This would be. This is where most of the patches should be. Um, that, that your your debug team will be creating patches and stuff like that, uh, and new drivers that haven't even started on the upstream path. Um, they'll they'll you'll just put the vendor tag on it and put your name by it, uh, or the vendor name by it. You know, like vendor Intel, for example. RFC. I haven't actually used the RFC one or seen it used yet, but from the text, it's basically if you're, you're too impatient to wait for it to actually get into something that's feeding Linux next, uh, you use the RFC one. Um, and I got some examples. So these are, these are two simple bad examples um, that I'm trying, that I, I want to try to make the point of, of Imagine, imagine a tree with about, you know, anywhere between 500 and 5,000 patches, and half of the, more than half of the patches look like these two, and you're given the job to migrate this, these patches to a new kernel version. You know, say you're, you have a product that has an extended life, lifespan, and you're concerned about security updates and being able to maintain security updates. Um, this is the kind of thing that will hurt your, ruin your day. Uh, let's see, it's 741. Let's see. Oops. Darn it. No. This one. Okay. So here's a patch that. <clears throat> Basically, it says it corrected some value, and it has a bug number, and then it does it does some stuff, and it, you know, it's it's actually not a bad patch, um, but the commit comment is is hideous, okay? Because what what's missing from this patch is what's what's so bad about having an incorrect TSF value? I really don't know. And what's in this bug number? What fails? What what testable? Is there a testable issue that, that says, oh, if I don't take this patch, this happens, this bad thing happens? There's no, there's no, there's no clear reason why it's important to fix this, have a correct TSF value here. Now, if I was, you know, I'm, I'm clearly I'm showing I don't really understand 802.11 very well. It might actually be really obvious if you're, if you're a network guy. But, in general, um, when the customer gets this, they won't, they, won't know, they won't have access to this bug database. They won't be able to look that up. Um, and um, I can't tell if this is actually a really important thing to, that, that, that needs to be ported forward or not. Um, let's see, my next one. Uh, is this it? Yes, this is it. So I was hoping Matt would be here because I wanted to tease him. Okay, so here's, here's an example uh, from, from a friend of mine. Um, it's another example of a one-line patch, and it also uses revert me. You know, what, <laughs> what, what does that mean, revert me, okay? I, when will it be appropriate to revert this patch? I, I can't tell, right? You know, it, it's, it's developers, Developers seem to think that putting, wedging revert me into the commit comment title um, is a get out of jail free card. 
it, it's not because so I've had to port this patch from from uh, 4.4 to 4.9, and I don't know if it's important. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure it is. Flushing the firmware from the cache is that's probably important to do, but um, <laughs> at least at least before you start up the device. Um, um, but you know, we have we have cache coherency on our hardware, so I'm not sure if this is actually needed. Um, yeah, so uh, other than that, it's actually a fine patch. It does what it says. Well, you know, it does something with flushing cache, so that's okay. Um, it, it could be worse, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, so there's, there's those two. Um, yeah, so you really kind of need to think about, think about um, imagine yourself rebasing these things. Oops. Let's see if I got that okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, also, I, I saw a talk yesterday, and uh, uh, the person was was uh, looking for good reasons to to justify upstreaming their code. And you know, one of the things that 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 I really think is it should be an easy sell for most most uh, businesses is to just talk about the security aspects of their of the, and the security liability of their code. You know, if you if, if you're management and engineering um, uh, culture uh, is in the mindset that, okay, we can just, you know, we're not network connected, we'll never have to update the kernel, we, we, we're, we're all good, we can, we can use, we can use a 3.4 kernel if we wanted to and get away with it and never do security patches, then then okay, but uh, that's not us and that's 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 not that's not what it, what we're working toward. Um, so, okay. So, hopefully, I provided some motivation. Uh, now I'm just going to kind of talk about what's the structure of a of a code review. So, from from for 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 my team, uh, basically the the engineers are expected to develop for, or they're expected to review for. Supportability and correctness. And supportability is, is it, is it clear what will happen if this patch isn't accepted? And will this patch be supportable one year from now when the authors aren't there? And how hard is this patch going to be to migrate to a new kernel version? Because you're going to do the migration, not, not, the, not the author, uh, in most cases. Um, and then uh, for correctness, you know, you need to check for bugs and uh, coding standards and, you know, is it well aligned with upstream? Uh, I'll talk more about those uh, through the talk. So supportability, you know, the commit, basically supportability mostly, mostly relates to commit comments uh, and inline comments. So does, does the commit comment, um, uh, oh, by the way, these um, these slides are up, well, a earlier version of these slides are already up on the website or uh, the, the conference site, uh, and I'll I'll refresh them with the final version here uh, after, after later today. <clears throat> uh, does the commit comment explain what's going to break and why it's important to uh, take this patch? Um, you know, does it explain what the change is and does it actually match the change? You know, because I've seen more than a few patches where the developer cut and paste a, a commit comment from one pat or one change to the next and sent it sent it my way um, and uh, that's kind of annoying um, uh, as you're reviewing these commits you need to you need to think about uh, the commit as a sentence you know they need to stand alone um, just like a sentence in a story or in a paragraph, and if they don't stand on, if they don't stand alone, or if they're a sentence fragment, or they're in, they're basically incomplete, and um, I really dislike those. You know, my, the typical example of a sentence fragment would be a um, uh, someone adding a adding a data data member, changing a data structure in a header file, but never re dereferencing that 
that, that, that change anywhere else in the patch. You know, that's, that's quite annoying. Um, another thing that you need to look out for, which, which actually hit me when I did that rebase, when I rebased those changes from 4.4 to 4.9, was uh, there was a patch that said, uh, that was, there's a patch that used to be in there that talked about adding a worn on, or a worn once uh, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a file. And after the rebase, uh, the, worn, the worn on actually, actually fell out. Um, so it was, a, it was a patch that I probably didn't need to rebase at all. But I ended up with a patch that actually didn't match the commit comment. So um, this can happen to people uh, by accident and on purpose. You, know, through you can either get it to happen by, you know, just by being lazy or just not, not as careful as you really need to be. So after a rebase, you actually really have to kind of re-review these patches from from the perspective of supportability again. Uh, so look out. Um, locking, you know, I'm basically these are, these are my hot buttons when I see people do stuff. Um, you know, so locking needs to be well documented, uh, you know, what the lock is actually protecting, and it needs to make sense, okay? Magic numbers really need to be traceable to uh, specifications whenever possible. And uh, if they're experimentally derived, admit it, you know, and, and, and uh, actually in the, in the comment, you probably ought to tell me what's going to go wrong if I use a different number there. You know, typically this happens and bring up people sprinkle wake um, delay loops all over the place. And then later on in the program, those delay loops, you start optimizing for boot time or performance or something, and now you start, you, you know, you find these delay loops, they just jump out at you <laughs> as you do your perf analysis. <clears throat> and um, when you're sitting there scratching your head, well, is it safe to remove that delay? You know, what, what, you know and, and, and you have to rediscover all, you know, the failure case of when, that, when, that, when you change the delay. Uh, and that's really kind of rude. You know, so it's, you're just being rude to your future selves or somebody else. Either way, it's, it's rude. Um, complicating, complicated and confusing logic needs to be, needs to be um, um, have some helpful inline commenting. Uh, print Ks and log messages. So as a reviewer, you got to look at these print Ks and log messages and, and, and think in terms of each one of these is a possible support call. Um, and uh, so you really want to make all your log messages and your print Ks count. Uh, they need to be, they need, they need, and they need, be, need to be kept to a minimum and they need to, need to uh, be, uh, uh, need to be useful, you know, just, just, you know, I was here or Kilroy was here kind of print Ks, you know, um, aren't that helpful, you know, it, it's, it's, um, uh, oh, reverts, yeah. So another thing as you review, as you review, review these, this kernel code, reverts are very common in an in a integration environment because you have a system integration uh, lead who is revert happy and they smell, if they smell a regression, they just revert the thing and ask questions later. Um, so if you, if you make them, if the developer makes the mistake of wedging in you know, multiple features or multiple changes and bug fixes into a single patch. That patch, all those features are at risk for rever getting reverted. Uh, and um, you really don't want to be the guy who forces uh, the, you know, forces a team to make a hard call between accepting all these features with a rev or the revert. You know, it's, they don't want to accept the revert typically. So. <clears throat> uh, make sure that don't accept patches. Basically, don't accept patches that mix mix bug multiple features or bug fixes in a single in a single go. Uh, just because actually, maybe multiple bug fixes is okay to mix, but adding features and bug fixes, you're gonna you're putting your feature at risk. Don't don't do that. Um, another thing that the code reviewer needs to do 
is uh, basically you need to imagine, imagine, as you're looking at this patch, you need to imagine yourself, you know, basically a year from now or something when the developers are no longer available and there's a big escalation, let's say it's a security issue, you know, and um, there's a patch that is identified as the problem. Um, is there enough information in this patch that you can understand what that patch is about and perhaps make some progress on it? Um, and, and you really kind of need to put yourself in the customer's position, in the customer's shoes, because they don't have access to the original developers. And you might after one year, you probably won't. But, <clears throat> you know, you, you really kind of need to think of that. Or another way to think of things is, you know, you know, think of yourself two years from now, assuming you stay with the team. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, and you're forced to you're forced to uh, rebase this these this set of set of beauties um, to a new kernel. You know, are you going to be able to do that um, and do a good job of it? Because just mechanical rebasing, I mean, rebasing is fairly mechanical, uh, but you really act, you know, you know, like I said earlier, you know, with that example, you, you really kind of need to look at the patches as you as you do the rebase. You know, you, it's easy to fall into doing a git rebase or, or some other rebase and uh, just kind of uh, plowing through and, you've, and you don't really look at the patches, you're just trying to get them to rebase and compile, right? And uh, then, then once it compiles, you move on is, is typically the behavior. But you really have to go back and review the patches again properly. And uh, so make sure the patches are good. You're just trying, I'm just trying to protect you from yourself. Your, trying to protect your future self from your, your today self. Okay, and I just want to show a patch that's, that I consider is not too bad. Uh, it's over here. Is this the right one? Nope, that's not the one. That's not it. That's not it. Ah, shit. Should be here. Uh, no. I think that's it. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So here's a super trivial patch. Um, it all fits on one screen. Essentially what this patch does is it, it replaces bin awk with user bin awk. And this patch is actually, you know, uh, you know, the commit comment, you know, we see you got the OS, it's for Linux, Lock, Yocto. And you know, it, it says, you know, it says use, use user bin awk instead of bin awk. And, Essentially, the reason why we need this patch is because uh, the Pocky build will will basically fail when it tries to get the ver the version from the Linux with with without this patch. So you know that if you don't take this patch, you're going to break you're going to break Yocto, essentially. Um, incidentally, the, the reason why this patch exists is because someone from Red Hat, and apparently Red Hat likes bin awk for where it likes to put its awk program, uh, but everybody else kind of likes user bin awk. So this is just to work around a change that was put in. Um, but this, I, I consider this a pretty good patch. This, this would be hard to say no to. And this is what you want all your patches to be. You want all your patches to be hard to say no to. Um, you know, you'll have testable, behaviors associated with not taking the patch. You know, that's, um, you, you need that motivation on the patches. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about correctness. Um, uh, let's see, we're, we're doing pretty good on time. Um, so, you know, as doing a code review, you need to look for correctness, you know, so you need to do all the normal things, you know, is the logic correct, you know, is there a cut and paste error, are the error paths correct, you know, did you, are you leaking, a, are you leaking locks or, or, or memory, uh, does the code make sense, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of times it might not, um, uh, and does, does the code match, does the code match to commit comment? Um, I know this is kind of redundant to supportability, but 
if it if it doesn't match the commit comment and it's just not correct, you know. And and uh, the uh, is there is there justification for the patch uh, that actually doesn't need to be there? But and is the code aligned with upstream kernel.org directions? You know. So um, example of this is um, recently, actually a few weeks ago, um, we actually last week. Um, uh, we had this patch, um, I had this patch come past me and I had to reject it, you know, and essentially what this patch did was it did a really nasty hack to a function called um, alarm, suspend, alarm timer suspend. You know, basically it was no opting out that function uh, because that function on this, on this particular platform uh, resulted in suspend, suspend behavior uh, not being what people wanted uh, or, or could tolerate uh, for the program. Uh, the suspend architecture of this, this particular device uh, or platform uh, was different because Android is running in, in a virtual machine in this, in, this, in this case. So having the RTC timer wake up uh, really wasn't welcome in this in this in this particular use case, and uh, so anyway, they they no opt they they just deleted everything in that function and put a return zero in it, uh, and I said no, and then I you know and I looked more closely and I noticed that hey there's a there's a config macro wrapping that function, you know I wonder if you could just change that config and get the same same result right you know and it turns out that's what that's that's what happened. You know, so you, you need to look, you know, and that's what I mean by upstream alignment. Um, that sort of thing, that's, that's a fairly good example of an upstream alignment. Another, another example, which I haven't seen in a few years, but it has happened in the past, where people will forklift from an older kernel an entire subsystem to a newer kernel, you know, and just, don't say no to those <laughs> if you can. Sometimes you get forced. Um, uh, memory allocation and deallocation. You, you know, check 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 for memory leaks. You know, um, uh, look at it. Question every global you see. You know, is the global really necessary? Is someone just trying to be lazy and not pass something by value and just put a you know wedge it in a global? I've seen that happen. Um, you know, and then for every glo global that you see added, you need to check, you know, you need to interrogate it or question it with respect to does it need a lock? And it probably does. Um, so globals are a pain. Um, locking, locking is an even bigger pain. Um, so you need to check to see if the locking is sane. Sometimes it won't be. Um, uh, I know. I, Locks protect data, not code, from concurrent access. Uh, um, so, so there's this, there's a story that I was that I that I that I tell with this is. Um, so locks are kind of like capacitors on hardware, uh, to me a little bit. Um, so, at least at least uh, non-sane locking is a lot like capacitors on hardware. So, hardware engineers will come in. So, so a friend of mine who is a hardware a hardware guy at Intel, um, you know, I was showing this is like years ago when I was making making some little robot things and was talking about some problems I was having with the st board stability, you know, and he and then he, he told me this story about the cap fairy. So apparently in hardware circles there's this there's this phenomena about being visited by the cap fairy. So what this boils down to is you have a board that's not stable. And then one morning you come in and the board's, you know, better, you know, and, and there's a, a, a whole slew of new capacitors sprinkled across the board, you know, and it makes things better, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it's, you don't want a lock fairy coming in and sprinkling spin locks around trying to make things better. It, it, it's happened. I've seen it. Haven't seen it happen lately, but it used to happen. Um, don't let it happen. <laughs> don't, don't let, you know, where, where locks are taken need to make sense. Um, and uh, so uh, be careful with your locks. Um, 
Static analysis, you need to review your static analysis. So we have, we have, some, we have some CI tools associated with the patches as they come in. And they run, they basically run III and some <coughs> other things, uh, and some security analysis as well. And, and you need to, as the code reviewer, you need to review this stuff, you know, and make a decision whether or not it needs to be in, uh, enforced or not. So, you know, uh, oh, go ahead. Not in header, I haven't seen too many in the header files. Most of the security, uh, the static analysis security checkers, you know, um, the commercial checkers, uh, they tend to give me false alarms on string copies mostly. You know, uh, like yeah. You'll, you'll, have you'll have a lot of false alarms. I know, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. it's true. That's why you need a human to look at them. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's uh, yes, that's been my experience with, with that tool as well. <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, yeah, um, don't let new compiler warnings in. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll talk about, I'll talk about um, check patch, I think, next. Okay, about check patch. So check patch is a annoying thing. If you, if you, if you enforce check patch compliance in a draconian manner through CI tools, you will end up with a lot of ugly looking code. You know, it, it's, check patch will, will also will sometimes call out errors that you can't work around. Um, so you need, you, need to, you need to review the check patch and use your, and use your head. Um, you know, check patch is great. You need to you, you need to run it, but you need to review it, uh, review the output. Uh, one case one case we had with check patch was um, uh, the um, uh, I think the audio team was adding was adding uh, uh, some backports was doing a backport from upstream. So this is code that was already upstream, and they're doing a backport, adding it to some old kernel that I was working on, and. It had a fairly complicated uh, uh, macro in it, and check patch was flagging this macro as being too complex. Um, and well, you know, it's it's a change I can't, I, we couldn't fix. We needed that change, uh, and so eventually, what we did is we just disabled check patch until we got that patch merged, and then we turned check patch on again. It was it was really it was really lame, um, but. You know, so I really prefer human reviewers to review this output of these things, not not just a robot. Um, and as a developer, if you're if you're submitting code that you know it's got some check patch issues, uh, be ready be ready with get you know be ready to be challenged. You know, because we're we're going to ask it. Do you really need that? Or is, should that be fixed? Why why is this okay? Will be what you will be asked. Uh, security scanning, you know, you need to review the security analysis, and you need to be very careful before you you let the patch in, you know, it's 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 or disposition the um, issue as false alarm. So you know, it, it's as you get practice looking at this kind of stuff, it, you you get fairly quick at it. But you know, it can you know, like you said, with 1,500 false alarms, it's like oh great, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's. it's um, but um, uh, ask for help before you disposition a possible security issue. And uh, um, I know this isn't, I don't think I have a slide to talk about this story, but um, uh, one time, you know, if you see a patch that's clearly doing stuff that's security related, you know, like checking permissions before doing stuff, you know, get you know, it doesn't hurt to get expert expert uh, review uh, on it. You know, ask 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 someone who who might know better. You know, for example, there was some patch that was ported, that was um, oh, I forget what it was for. It was I think it was for changing some C groups, some C C group properties. But um, it was it was it it wasn't using the. It wasn't using the same security check that that Ptrace uses, and which is, 
you know, which is what was which which was what was proper for this for this particular scenario. Um, and uh, you know, I saw that patch. I wasn't really sure if it was good, and you know. I'm lucky enough to work with some some really really great upstream people. So I asked Arian Vanderven to take a look at it and ask you know, and he gave me, he he told me, oh that needs to use use the same check that Ptrace uses, otherwise it's wrong. <laughs> so it's uh, you know it's 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 good to have experts around that you can ask for help. Um, I'll talk about asking for help more later too. Um, another thing about correctness is is the code compliant with your business policy? You know, is it, is it in compliance with your business policies and legal, legal and business policies? You know, does it leak confidential information? Um, this confidential information could be a customer name, it could be a code name of a project. Um, you know, you just, you just need to look at the commit comment and ask yourself, is it okay to have this uh, in GPLv2 out in the wild? Um, even just for the comment, commit comments. Um, if you're an IP vendor or, or, or a silicon provider, you know, is, is this patch touching any undocumented registers that were previously not documented, you know, or using, you know, secret new MSR uh, register magic numbers? Um, that's basically, uh, you're, leaking, you're leaking IP if you do. Uh, so you need to check to see that everything's Approved. Um, most I doubt if I, I don't expect a lot of people to have to do that in this in this room other than me. Oh well, Intel people. <laughs> um, uh, you need you know do business approvals exist for uh, the IP that the code's for? Um, and another thing you need to check for correctness is where was this where was the content sourced from? So I'll talk about that more on this next slide. So a common thing that, that people will do when they're developing code is they'll, they'll look around at other trees and they'll harvest, harvest code. And when you harvest this code, it's really, really easy to do it in a way that, that results in you being named as the author of the code. And and you really don't want to be, blame, be, be called out as the person that was stealing someone else's code. Um, even though it's GPL, um, you don't want to, you, you want to respect the copyright and the authorship. Um, it's, it's more than just a plagiarism issue. Um, you know, the, the easy fix to this problem is to use git amend author and fix it. <laughs> you know, so you need to make sure your developers know this, this, this git uh, snippet. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's, it's more than plagiarism, you know, it, it, it provides, it provides uh, um, uh, 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 trust. Uh, that it, 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 it provides a herd mentality to the customer that, oh, okay, this, this patch was taken from um, or this code was taken from, taken from, say, the Cyanogen Mod Samsung 5X kernel, um, which I have, have, I do have, I did have an example like that in, in, in the internal class. Um, that is just a hideous tree, by the way. It's, it's just, it's got 30, it, everything squashed into one commit, you know, it's got like 30,000 lines of changes. And it's, it's awful. Um, anyway, but but you need to you need to you need to call it out so that so that you can provide a high a, a herd mentality a little bit to to uh, provide more credibility to your patch. Um, uh, okay, what does a good code review look like? So, basically, a good code review helps good code get in quickly. That's the biggest thing. Um, and you know, you of course you got to review for supportability and correctness. And you know, in in an integration environment, you're gonna have crappy patches that are that are, you know, really needed to get in quickly, but they really suck. Um, and you're you're gonna have to, you know, 
as a, as, a, as a code reviewer, you're expected to roll up your sleeves and help fix it, you know, um, and then uh, uh, try to put in place some follow-up commits, plans for follow-up commits to, to fix the issues. It's really kind of a bitter pill to swallow as a code reviewer, as a kernel maintainer, but you, you kind of need to do the, be able to do this as well. Uh, more details about what makes a good code review. Uh, you need to provide actionable feedback to the to the author. You know, you may need to make clear what needs to change um, in order for the patch to get merged. It's not good enough to tell the tell the developer that you make my eyes bleed. You need to actually, you know, give them uh, feedback that they can do something with. Um, you know, so you need to explain why the code needs to be changed. You also need to try to try to make sure that you you, you review the whole code in one go, you know, because um, you know this this can be hard to do if the if the patch doesn't doesn't um, if the patch doesn't uh, get past the you know uh, the 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 static analysis very well uh, and is really a turd you 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 it's really hard for you to do much with it other. But but you can you can throw it back and say make you know make make it pass all this static analysis checks and then I'll then I'll review it, which is which is fair. But after it passes all those 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 items, you need to review the whole patch and, and attempt to to um, get all these get all the issues uh, enumerated for the for the developer to fix. Um, and this is important because it, you know well for for Intel it's important because we have a. Um, you know, a worldwide engineering team, and we really can't afford to have a, a have a 24-hour turnaround time for every every bug fix. Oh, three minutes already. Okay, um, I think I'm pretty close to done. Um, so you don't want to you don't want to start playing games with the you know with 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 this sort of thing. Uh, uh, when discussions stall, you got to reach out to the developer and, and to management. Uh, many times, the developer will will decide, you know, I've reviewed patches and I bled all over it and I threw it back at them, and they then I get radio silence in return. You know, so I spent uh, I spent hours reviewing that patch and then they just blow me off. And what they're doing is they're that many times they're playing scheduled chicken with me because they go, oh, okay, I'll just wait close, wait till we get closer to the milestone, then I'll send it your way again, see if you change your mind, because now you're going to have management crawling up your backside to make that, to get that thing in there. Um, don't, 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 don't let them do that. Talk to their managers and chew out their managers um, and escalate it. Um, don't, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, a lot of good learning you can do. A lot of good growing opportunities when you get uh, some, you know, when you consult some expert. Uh, give examples. Be patient. Um, key takeaways. This is like my last slide. Uh, hopefully, you you understand how the patches are going to be used by customers. You're going to understand the the. Um, uh, the importance of reviewing the patches from the point of view of, uh, of that, with the assumption that you're going to have to reuse these patches across different kernel versions and you're going to have to execute a kernel migration at some point. Uh, you know, use good prefix conventions. Stop writing bad patches if you're a developer. <coughs> um, and um, uh, if you write bad patches, I certainly won't like you. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I guess that's it. And I'm pretty much out of time. So awesome. <laughs> 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 <laughs>